Hello everyone and welcome to our third interview of British Science Week where we are delighted to be interviewing four engineers from TALIS. Today we are going to hear from Ted McRobbie, a machine learning research engineer. Now my name is Scott and I work at Primary Engineer. For those of you who don't know, this is the Leaders Award competition where we ask the question, if you were an engineer, what would you do? Pupils from the ages of 3 to 19 anywhere in the UK can join and every single person who takes part receives a Grady certificate from a real life engineer, just like the ones we interview. Now, entries have already started arriving from all over the UK, so remember and get them sent to Primary Engineer HQ when you're finished. Remember, the deadline is March 22nd, so we look forward to seeing your ideas very soon. Now, as part of these interviews, we have been speaking with engineers who work on loads of different projects all of them showing the wonderful, interesting and exciting things that happen when you work in engineering. Although we host them live, you can catch all the recordings on our YouTube channel. Now, our special guest is going to start with a 10 minute presentation and then we're going to open up to the audience for questions. Um, if you do have a question, just type it in the chat box in Teams. We unfortunately can't receive audio from the audience. So if you do have a question, just type it in. But for now, I'm going to hand over to our wonderful special guest, Ted. Cheers, Scott. Really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, so my name is Ted McCroby. I'm going to just quickly give a 10 minute presentation. Hopefully, a bit less than that. We've got more time for uh, all your questions. I'll quickly just share my screen. So, yeah, uh, essentially, what I want to expand on is how I got to where I am, what I've done, uh, and what does an engineer do is the primary question that we want to answer here. Uh, so, in terms of my journey, I'm going to start off, you know, basically when I was leaving school. Uh, so at GCSEs, uh, I got like three Bs and five Cs. I, I did sort of middling in the pack. Um, I'm not sure what the equivalent is nowadays. I know you do it in, in numbers, which always confuses me. Um, uh, and then after that, I went and did, uh, I, I did sixth form, uh, where I took three A-levels. Um, and at the time, the majority of people did four. Um, so I, I, I felt I was a little, you know, at the, at the bottom end of the pack there. Uh, and I took maths, physics, chemistry, because those just happened to be what I appeared to be relatively good at. Um, and I didn't like English, despite getting a B in it. Um, and in my first year, because it gets graded separately in each year, uh, I got CDE um, and the D was in physics. Uh, so I, I, again, I didn't do outstanding, uh, shall we say. Um, and yeah, generally, when you do A-levels, you tend to go down a grade uh, in between that first and second year. Uh, but I worked really hard uh, because I didn't want to get CDE. Um, so in my second year, I came out with BCD. And even then, you know, it was it was hardly outstanding. Uh, the majority of the people that I knew going to university generally were getting A's and B's. Um, so I, uh, I I had a bit of a tricky time there. And I knew I wanted to go to university uh, because more than anything else, I just wanted to move out of home, to be blunt. Um, and I didn't really know what to do. So I, I sort of asked my parents, because who else? Uh, and I can remember distinctly my mum my saying, you couldn't do a hard science because you know, I just never really showed an aptitude for it. I was interested, but it wasn't something I was good at. Uh, and classically, I was, mm, I was a bit stubborn. I went, mm, no, I can. So I decided to do uh, physics, astrophysics and cosmology at Portsmouth University for uh, three years. Um, and that was really good fun. I kind of I, I fell in love with the topic there. I remember going in thinking astrophysics, cosmology, it's a very niche field. You can't really do a lot with it. Physics, you know, was my was my savior there. And that, that was applicable in the real world. Um, but I, I was completely besotted immediately um, with with the uh, astronomy side of things and uh, astrophysics, as I say. Um, not too many interesting things happened in the first and second year, or at least stuff that I could talk about. <laughs> so uh, my, my dissertation at the end of my three years is uh, my final piece of written work um, that, if you're good enough, can get published in scientific literature. Um, I was looking at the first stars in the universe. So we see supermassive black holes that are very, very bright, um, very, very far away, which means they're also very old. Um, and with our current theoretical models, um, it doesn't make any sense that they're there. We still don't really know why they're there. Um, but what I wanted to do was using computer simulations to try and model how those stars were born and how they grow and how they became those black holes. Um, and it was a it was a great success. I really enjoyed myself there. There was definitely frustrations there, but um, we got there in the end and I, de I helped develop a uh, theory on how those black holes formed with a PhD student who, was, uh, who I think graduated a couple of years ago. 
Um, and the images here, so a couple of years back, I went to Tenerife uh, with my then university uh, to go and take some images and collect some data on galaxies on a slightly different project. Um, and I used that telescope uh, on the top of the volcano there, Mount Peed, uh, and took the images that you can see uh, on your right with a, I think, 20 or 30 year old telescope now. But as you can see, it's uh, still fairly good. <laughs> Uh, following that, I, I decided I didn't really have enough of university. Um, generally now you can do an integrated master's, but because I didn't select that, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't change the course, it was too late. Um, but I was lucky enough that I, I could still afford to go and do an MSc, which is sort of a precursor to doing a PhD. It's a 12 month course um, and it's just a continuation of your studies and it's more research focused. Um, obviously, I didn't I didn't do particularly well at school, so I decided either I've got to you know, go big or go home. I only applied to St Andrews um, and that's the number one university in the UK in this field. They beat Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and I didn't ever think that I'd get in, but uh, COVID was was there, was present at that time. Uh, so I think, you know, that benefit, I benefited from that slightly and they let me in uh, for those 12 months. And uh, again, I, I've had a really, really great time. I was developing uh, software for astronomers to use around the world to process some new data sets. Um, and I was looking at galaxy evolution because we know it's wrong um, and trying to improve on that. Uh, and then I, for my, my thesis at the end of that degree, I looked at Gaia telescope data. That was a telescope launched back in 2015 um, with some special sensors on it and it's huge sky surveys. Um, and is in an optical wavelength. Most of them are in infrared. So I was looking the universe in a different way essentially uh, and I used a brand new technique that can be only used with this telescope to try and find and map out certain kinds of stars and we tried to experiment first with this cocoon nebula that region on your left there um, and really the idea is, is can we find stars that's in the cloud there uh, and again almost by luck we didn't expect to find anything really um, but we found about 400 stars that we'd never seen before there um, and we had this sort of use case for then using that across this huge survey. Um, unfortunately, that never got published um, because for various reasons. Um, so I'm hoping to go back and do a PhD on this, but um, we'll, we'll see if I can do that. <laughs> uh, after that, I decided, well, I've been in academia. I am now a poor student. I need to earn a bit of money and move out of home and be a person. Um, so I decided to apply to lots of different places. It was the end of COVID. So I was applying like mad. I think I made about 300 applications um, and I was successful with TALIS at the Research Technology and Innovation Centre there in Reading. It was about two and a half hour commute from where I am now uh, in, in sort of just north of Brighton. Um, so it was difficult, but it was worth it. Uh, I learned about machine learning, artificial intelligence, how to do stuff with software. And, and basically I was trying to teach computers how to think and do interesting topics. Um, after my time there, I found I wasn't having an amazing time, especially with that long commute. So I applied to transfer to where I am now, which is at the training and simulation department. I'm still doing machine learning and a bit of project management as well. Um, I'm looking to score some business with them as well. So I'm, I'm slowly climbing up the ladder um, and we have really exciting clients like the Ministry of Defence, NATO, other European governments and lots, lots of industry um, as well, because we are an international company. Uh, and we work primarily in defence, communications, transportation and the space domain. Uh, in terms of where I'm going, I want to learn more about machine learning. I'd like to experiment a bit more with management. I'm finding uh, an enjoyable experience, I think, trying to lead other people down where I've been in project, in project creation. Uh, and with the kinds of machine learning projects we're doing now with things like ChatGPT and DALI2, um, which can generate images and uh, essentially essays uh, for you with just a few prompts. Um, and then also, as I said, I want to go and do a PhD. So actually yesterday I, I had my interview uh, for, for where I'd like to go, uh, which hopefully went well. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's essentially where I want to go. Uh, and along with science communication, I want to point out. Um, it's one of the motivations I'm doing this, if I'm completely honest. <laughs> so give me a review. Please tell me how I'm doing. <laughs> Uh, following that, so what does TALIS do? It's a little bit of a broader thing because it's not just about me. Uh, so as I said, we work in plenty of different sectors, defence and security, cyber, aerospace, do all sorts really. Uh, and we take really big roles across all engineering sectors. 
So two thirds of all planes that take off and land in the world do so with Talus technology. Uh, and we get contracted all the time by Transport for London. So if you use the, the tube um, or you're trying to catch a train and if it's late, sorry, that's probably our fault with our prediction algorithms, but that's sort of stuff that we take care of. Um, and in terms of Astro, because obviously I've got a vested interest, uh, there's Bepi Colombo, which explores Mercury, and we were heavily involved with funding that, um, along with James Webb and Plato, which is a future of uh, What else is out there? So obviously software and machine learning, things that I do. There's also hardware, so robotics, mechanical engineering, cybersecurity, medicine. So if you want, if, if you're interested in what happened over the pandemic and creation of vaccines and how much of an uphill battle that was, um, that, that's very interesting for engineering. We've got lots to do there. Uh, aerospace with you know planes, jets, both commercial and in defence. Um, speaking of in defence, electronic warfare, we've got submarines, tanks, jets, all sorts of things. Uh, and the space domain, so space telescopes, but also rockets like SpaceX and ESA, uh, and planetary science like Beth B. Columbo that I showed earlier. For infrastructure, there's power and energy, so you know uh, that can be anything from current coal uh, coal power. Or it could be renewable energy, which is obviously where we're going to be going, and uh, hydrogen power uh, and transportation, as I said, with TFL. Uh, and in terms of nuclear, which is definitely going to be up and coming, there's nuclear warfare, unfortunately. But the more that we research and invest uh, money into those kinds of areas, the more we learn, the safer that we are. Uh, and energy as well. We're making huge breakthroughs with fusion energy, and that's really exciting, too. Uh, so why would you want to be an engineer? Uh, I think it's a very abstract question because it's such a broad field. I'm sure that you can justify it in many different ways. Whatever you're interested in, there's definitely a place in the field for you. Um, but for me, what I really value is first, first and foremost, it pays actually quite well, surprisingly well, especially in defence. So I'm, I'm only two years into my career, probably less than that. Um, I'm 23. But I own a car, I own my own house, I can afford to do a PhD, you know, these are things that are really uncommon nowadays and I'm incredibly grateful for the position that I'm in. I almost feel like it's down to no fault of my own, I'm here. <laughs> um, and there are great benefits, so you can have money off at restaurants, you have lots of conferences abroad, lots of flexible working, I work where I want, when I want, with what hours I want, whatever works for me. There's no complaints generally as long as I turn up to the meetings and get the work done. Um, there's interesting work as well. There's so many really cool projects that I really wish I could tell you about, but a lot I can't. Um, and there's generally lots of funding, the broad spectrum of work to do. Uh, and of course, you can tell people you're a spy. You know, there's lots of contracts that can be this higher classification that are all officially sensitive with NATO and the government. Uh, and you can learn about, you know, all the projects that you want and try to, uh, what do they say, broaden, expand on your portfolio, all those management kind of words. Uh, and how do you get there? Um, again, it's quite abstract. It's all your own individual journey. You'd never let anyone tell you that you can't do it, that you haven't got the grades. I mean, look at my journey. I, I definitely didn't give the right values at the beginning and I wasn't particularly interested in engineering until I got the job. So just do what interests you and you end up where you want to be. Uh, I would definitely recommend to do a degree. You don't have to do it down the conventional sense. I'm seeing so many people do degree apprenticeship now and they do it in a much more manageable way and they earn a salary. I'm immensely jealous of that. They have no debt and they have the degree um, and you don't have to do it full time and you don't have to do it in engineering. Um, there's just no one way really. Um, you don't need good grades. Uh, I reckon I'm about four minutes over. I hope to be under but here we are. <laughs> um, yeah I suppose I'll open up for questions. And we've had loads of questions coming in already and um, we've had a few people ask this but I'm going to start with a question from Archie and Jake in Mid Calder. Do you enjoy your job and what is your favourite part? That's a really interesting question. So I do really enjoy what I do now. And I think it's because it gives really great benefits. And it's really interesting fundamentally. I'd love to expand more about what I do, but because of the classification, I can't really. Um, but I'm, I'm working, I know this sounds bad, but I'm working at a computer all day coding, but I really enjoy that. Um, there's also lots of scope to meet with people, go abroad, go to conferences. Um, yeah, and, and I, ultimately I get to do what I kind of want to do anyway. If I wasn't working at Talis, I'm sure I'd be developing similar things. Brilliant. So definitely sounds like an enjoyable job for you then, Ted. Yeah. Um, so as I say, we've had loads of questions. If you do have a question, just type it in Teams. This question comes from Mrs. Hughes' class. Um, they've been talking about how engineers solve problems. Is there a problem that you have used your engineering skills to solve? 
I, again, I think it's quite abstract. I mean, I, I wouldn't say you have necessarily engineering skills. It's kind of a, a way of thinking and approaching problems um, and using the scientific method, which uh, a great quote is, the only difference between messing around and doing science is writing it down. So again, it's just sort of doing what you think you should do. Um, and, and in terms of solving problems, you know, I, I do that every day, both in terms of talking to people and trying to reach a solution we're all happy with, as well as, you know, teaching a machine how to think. So we've had a few questions in about, about yourself and maybe a little bit about what you did at university as well. I think people have been inspired looking at all those pictures of stars and black holes. <laughs> um, Latia May asks, uh, how long did it take you to discover a new star? You said that you discovered about 400 new stars when you were working at St Andrews. Yes, so because of the space telescope, the data is is kind of there, sitting, waiting for you. It's just about picking through it. You know, there's there's terabytes of data, um, so it's very difficult to find it. It's very much a needle in a haystack. So I kind of found them instantaneously, um, all of them at once, um, and it really gives you that eureka moment of, oh God, that's there, and I was right. Um, and then there's a process of confirmation. But yeah, I, I try and brag about it at any, any given opportunity now. Great achievement of mine. Well, that was about that is literally the next question. This was from Brian Reeves. What's your best achievement? Yeah, no, I, honestly, I think I think it really is that. I mean, there, there's so many things that I've done uh, at, at at school more so than 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 at Talos. But you know, in terms of academia, that's where a lot of my fulfil my fulfilment came from, um, and and doing those kinds of projects. So um, again, um, sticking to to you and your career, this question comes from Five Parrot at the Parkgate Junior School. Um, why did you choose this job? You mentioned that you transferred. One of the reasons was it was closer, but also you're sort of doing a lot more now. Why is it this job you decided to choose? I found that at RTI, um, the the, <clears throat> the Research Technology and Innovation Centre, um, it wasn't a very good environment to learn it was more of a good environment to perform uh, at the time i didn't know very much about machine learning and i had a really great guy that was my line manager at the time and teaching me but i, I found it really overwhelming and i just didn't have the requisite knowledge and um, conversely i've i've now transferred to where i am now and i'm now on the opposite end i've got the skills and i'm teaching other people um yeah i, I hope that answers your question no, no, definitely. And it sounds as well like teaching other people is definitely something that a lot of the teachers out there can relate to, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so this question comes from Florence and Mrs. Hughes' class. Are any of your family members engineers? And if so, did they inspire you? Uh, no. So I, my family is a little uh, strange, I would say. There's five of us, but we're very, very different people. Um, my mother's a psychologist uh, and my dad is a, a tailored mortgage advisor. He owns his own business doing that. Uh, my sister is trying to be an architect at the moment. She's doing a degree, um, but actually working with a company called Igloo. She's doing very well. Uh, and my brother is uh, also doing psychology at university at the moment. Um, so I, I feel that, you know, the, the three kids have gone off and done academic things, but um, that's not all there is, I think, it's the bigger picture than that. Exactly. And like you said, even in school, your mum said that maybe this isn't for you and look at you now. Yeah. Um, so we've got a few more questions about about the job and what it's like to be an engineer. This one comes from East Den. Um, what does a typical day look like for an engineer? Is there one? <laughs> I think there are. I think there's professional answers and non-professional answers. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you here. I probably should be up by half past eight to get into the office, but I actually wake up maybe half past nine, ten o'clock, and start work there. Sometimes I go into the office. Sometimes I don't. I don't really have to give much notice for it. Um, and it, even though you're paid officially by the hour, um, as long as you get the work done, the work's done because it's, uh, I hate to say it, but it, it's a, a skilled profession. Yeah. Um, uh, and so as a consequence, you know, I probably do my full work week probably in three and a half or four days. So the rest of the time I'm not working, I'm thinking or doing what I'd like to do. Brilliant. Well, that I think that sounds like a pretty good job to me. Um, so um, we've got some more questions. And this question comes from Anya. Um, how long does it usually take to create and make your designs and inventions? Oh, it's it varies quite a lot, really, because you can can take projects on that take, you know, a few months. But there are projects that are much more extensive that can take 10 years to do. Um, wow. 
yeah, so it, it varies massively. Um, well, you just mentioned there as well that you get to do, um, when you manage to work through all of your work, you get to do things like the focus on this question comes from Sarah Drake. Um, what do you do in your spare time? What are some of your hobbies? Something I was working on recently was um, I was trying to develop a machine learning algorithm that can identify galaxies. So Ooh. 10 years ago, there was a survey called Galaxy Zoo, and it essentially was getting the general public to try and classify galaxies into elliptical and spiral, uh, mm -hmm. among other things. Um, and it was really, really interesting, but it's, it's just man hours of getting that done. Um, whereas now with machine learning, it would be better if we could get a computer to do that instead. So I've been trying to develop something where I ingest these kinds of images and train it on classifying them. Um, yeah. <laughs> so just, just on that, I wanted to ask, um, for those of you who don't know, like me, what is machine learning? Okay, so this is quite a difficult topic. <laughs> so at a basic level, if you imagine uh, a straight line, you might have come across the expression just y equals mx plus b. Um, how would you go about teaching a computer to recognize that? Um, and it's kind of kind of simple. It's almost trial and error. In, in a lot of ways, you know, you say, right, OK, if I have a some random numbers and I generate that uh, and it produces a line and then you can measure how incorrect it is and you can essentially train it to do the opposite of what it's doing. And eventually you get a straight line. Uh, the, then you expand that on something called logistic regression, um, which is essentially trying to get a computer to do that. But in terms of a yes or no question, I guess, a binary. And if that's what we call a neuron, you put lots of those together uh, and then you can do it, get it to do more complicated things like identifying what are in images and uh, I don't know what to do with certain kinds of data and, and, and classification and, and training it to do interesting things. E even in gaming, actually, you know, if you uh, look at a CPU uh, in, a, in a computer game, that often is trained on an on a algorithm not too dissimilar to that. You know, it's learning what other players do and then deciding what action it's going to perform. So when you're having to sort of come up with ways in which to to teach computers to do things like that learning or when you're coming up with new projects, and um, this question comes from Ribbon Class. Um, do you need to use your imagination to be an engineer? Massively, massively. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a, a a false assumption that if you're doing something like programming and coding, it's it almost makes sense and it's logical. I, I don't really agree with that because much like uh, an essay, you know, you start with a blank sheet and, and you need to start deciding, right, if I put that together, if I put that together, what happens then? Um, and it's messing around, but writing it down. Um, so you, you really need to use your imagination quite a lot, I would say, and, um, and, and think independently. I think that's a really big thing as well. If, if you can think on your own, and have not very much supervision that's really valued well just on that that sounds like a bit of advice because one of the questions we did have is from Saren, and Saren asks what advice would you give to someone who wants to become an engineer do what interests you i think is the biggest thing and um i think across your life you're going to come across a lot of people that say something along the lines of oh well you've done the wrong thing there or you've not quite got the experience that we're looking for i'd say nine out of ten times and really nine out of ten times that person is wrong um, wow. and, and you need to be stubborn and stand your ground and just keep plowing on um and, and yeah do what interests you and try and find a way because there probably is a solution so and um, we've got we've got some more questions. We've got a few minutes left. So anybody is out there sitting on question, please do type them in. This one comes from Hannah in Mid Calder. Um, what is your favourite thing you have recorded? Sounds like you must have coded quite a lot of stuff. Uh, I've done, uh, yeah, I've done quite a lot of coding. Um, I suppose the, my relationship with it is that I think you can either do things that make you happy or fulfilled, and I think coding is one of the things that makes you fulfilled because it doesn't make you happy in the moment. It can be very frustrating when something isn't quite doing what you expect it to do and you don't know why. Um, so in my undergraduate, and I was training those stars to, to, to grow and see what they look like, um, I was using a, a language called Fortran, um, which was one of the first languages actually designed um, after Ooh. the IPM. We used it for the Apollo program, for example. 
um, and had that I used the, uh, the 1977 version of that. So it was an old, old programming languages and very frustrating and very clunky. Um, and I didn't really have much training on it, but ultimately working it out, finding out how it's used and, and, and trying to get to a solution there. That is when I remember having my first real Eureka moment in that. Wow. Um, and as a, as a pro as well on that. So if you know Fortran 77 and you get approached by a big company because a lot of their systems still use these old coding oh, languages. Really? You can charge over a thousand pounds a day to code in that language because that is a skill they need right now. I might go and learn it myself. That sounds like something to be quite handy. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, we've heard a lot about machine learning and a bit about your software and the software engineering coding. But Amy asks, do you have to make a lot of prototypes? Uh, again, we, we, so we're using technical terms here. A lot of what I do, I wouldn't say is prototypes because it barely hangs together in the very beginning. Um, and so in terms of prototyping and making a version of that and a version of that and a version of that, absolutely. That happens throughout the process, especially with programming. Um, but in terms of having uh, a version of something that works, um, I, I've not quite got to that point I found where you have a version of something that works, you work on it more and you have a second version. Um, in, in the industry, we call that version control. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I've done less mature projects where it's more research driven and it's brand new out of the box and you're trying to create it in the first place. So I hope to get more experience in that, So, but I haven't done it yet. So. Well, yeah. Um... So, um, yeah, so talking about that and experience and, and growing in the future of your career, um, we have a question from David. Uh, how do you feel your engineering skills have developed over the years? Oh, hugely. I mean, in terms of engineering skills, I think when I was at university, it was very much about learning first principles and actually doing more astrophysics than anything else. But then getting to TALIS, what I learned there was very industry based and it was almost useful skills because I remember when I joined, you know, I could I could code, but in terms of, I don't know, programming a physical thing to do an operation, it was a bit abstract at that point. I remember it being really difficult to work out how to do that. But at this point, I'm sort of, I'm coming up with different ideas um, about how to, how to solve real world problems with, and being able to do it, I suppose. Um, yeah, so I, I think that those kind of skills you you learn almost along the way, very passively. Um, in terms of things I do know that I learned is actually machine yeah. learning and software and um, industry standards and what is classified as you know safe and unsafe to launch and all those kinds of things. So um, we've got there's a few this this question is actually coming from a few people. Um, uh, how long does it take to train to become an engineer? It depends what we define. Um, I would say that if you if you want to be an engineer, um, you can do it straight out of sixth form if you do an apprenticeship. Um, but 50 percent of people now have a degree. So I do think it's becoming more and more a necessity. Um, but it doesn't have to be done like the classic hard way like yeah. I do. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but in terms of training, when I got there. In my current department, I think I did maybe a week of training of, you know, but, but that was more. If you fall over, fill out this form kind of thing. <laughs> um, training is all is more something that, again, happens along the way that you you pick up both formally and informally in, you know, career development and just having a chat with your mates, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, just look at the time. I think we've got time for one more question and I'm going to pick a question that was sent in to us. And that question is. What excites you about the future of technology? There's so many things that's happening right now that's really interesting. Unfortunately, in defence, I can't talk about any of it. But <laughs> one project that I'm looking into is uh, there's a Chinese company that escapes the name at the moment, uh, and uh, Panasonic as well. They're looking at electric vehicles. And what they want to do is instead of buying the car that come with a battery that you'll have to replace in 10 years because it breaks, yeah. instead what you do is you buy a car and you lease a battery and then you go to what is essentially would be a, like a, a, a fuel pump petrol station and instead of filling up your car you just give, give them back the battery and then they lease you a new one uh, for oh, free wow. because you lease the same battery if you damage it obviously you pay for it but 
if it's not damaged and it's just flat or whatever and it means that you don't need to charge your car because you just go and trade in the battery and then they charge it there i think it's a fantastic idea and there's infrastructure problems but on the face of it i think that's really exciting that is that is really quite cool, actually, because um, yeah, just the and there's there's so much stuff about what you do with old batteries. So I literally behind me right now is a box of batteries. I've got to go take them to be recycled. So if I swap them out with people that could go and recharge them, that solves a lot of problems. Absolutely, yeah, no, it, it is definitely a problem. And pricing as well. Pricing is a real big because if you look at the second hand market, I know this is a bit adult, but if you look at the second hand market for electric vehicles now, it's still ludicrously expensive. But if you're not buying a battery. The prices are going to go down when there's a secondhand market still. But, you know, it's about trying to think ahead, not think about how to do it right now. So. Yeah. And that's the, so the exciting future. Uh, and I think that is a great place to bring this interview to an end. I want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us. But a massive thank you to Ted for helping inspire all the engineers in the making out there, because now it is your turn to come up with your own engineering ideas. Remember and send them to us once you finish them so we can get our certificates sent out and then we'll hopefully see you at the public exhibitions at the end of the school year. Um, remember, this interview will be uploaded to YouTube, so if you would like to share it with a colleague or rewatch it in full, you can find it there. And remember, the deadline for submissions is March 22nd, so we will see your ideas very soon. But now, a special thanks again to Ted. And remember, if you were an engineer, what would you do?